Facebook family. How's everybody doing? First off, let me start off by saying all praises, all honor, and all glory to the Most High God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose name is Jesus. Uh, my name is Noel Berry. I'm with the Israel Bible Study Institute, where our aims and our goals and our objective is to bring biblical literacy to a biblically illiterate world through the reading of the uncut word of God. We read straight from the King James Version of the Bible. We leave our denominational beliefs at the door, and we do no interpretating of the Bible. Uh, today I'm coming on earlier than what I thought I would do. I didn't even expect to come on today because I had some stuff to do this morning, but I took care of that business and then uh, got finished with it a little earlier than I expected. So instead of doing this lesson tomorrow, uh, I'll start this lesson today and end tomorrow with part two of the lesson. But let me jump right on into it because I don't want to spend too much time uh, talking. I just want to get right up into the lesson. And the lesson is entitled, He is not a, the God of the dead. A biblical explanation to 1 Samuel 28, 7 through 15. And today is the beginning, or tomorrow actually is the beginning of a, of a season that most people use to honor the dead. And it's called Halloween. And not to get so much into the history of it or that, because I just want to stick with the Bible in this lesson right here. But there's no getting around it that Halloween or all, 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 all Halloween has nothing to do with anything but the dead. All the paraphernalia that you see relating to Halloween deals with dead. Skeletons, haunted houses, tombstones, spider webs. Cobwe uh, cobwebs and spiders, all this has to do with dead. And it's become so much prevalent in our society over here in America today that people are beginning to take that custom of Halloween. Like I said, I'm not going to get into the history of it, but just it's, it became a tradition over here in America. I, as a little child, and probably all of us at one point in time, went door to door trick or treating. Well, even churches today who claim or profess to be a uh, People of the word are beginning to have haunted houses and trick-or-treat parties and stuff like that inside their church and using it as excuse and saying, well, this is, we're creating a safer environment for these children to engage in these activities. And these activities which the children are engaging in are actually paganistic activities. But as I said, this lesson is entitled, He is Not the God of the Dead, a biblical explanation to 1 Samuel 28 and 7.15. Now this, this lesson I came up with actually a while back and never had a chance to put it on the table because a lot of different things were going on. But uh, I had a friend who was, we were talking about some, I can't even remember what we were talking about, but he was talking about the dead. And I was telling him something about his parents or, or dead, you can't talk to him and all that. And as usual, what most people do, they will say, they will read something in the Bible or hear somebody speak about something in the Bible, but they never read it themselves. They say, well, you know, with uh, uh, Saul, he's, he talked to Samuel and Samuel was dead. And that's it. That's all they know or what they think they know. And so we're going we're gonna to thoroughly examine this because I because I know a lot of people believe in uh, talking to the spirits of the, of the ancestors and in particular on Halloween, one of the aspects of Halloween, they are they believe that at this point in time that the veil between the living and the dead is so thin that the dead people could come and walk around amongst the living and all this old nonsense stuff that cannot be found founded in the Bible. But yet they claim to be believers of the Bible, the Word of God. Also during this lesson, we're going to learn a lot of other things on the way to learning things, but my main point of this lesson is or main objective of this lesson is to bring about biblical awareness or literacy as it pertains to 1 Samuel verse 28, 7 and 15. So I want to start the lesson off in, in Mark 12 and 27. Mark 12 and 27. It says, He is not the God of the dead, with the God of the living. Point blank. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. 
It's talking about Jesus, talking about, about the Father. They're not God. They, he is not a God of the dead. But Halloween has nothing to do with anything but the dead. So let's put our foundation together and we can build upon it. Let's get a biblical understanding about the dead. Because a lot of people don't have a, 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 a biblical understanding of the dead. There's people who believe that their dead loved ones are in heaven right now, flying around with angel wings, looking down at them, smiling. Some people go to the grave, to the cemeteries, uh, on the anniversary of their death, or on a particular anniversary uh, of a highlight of their loved one's life, and sit there and eat and drink and engage in a conversation with those people as if those people can hear them. So let's get a biblical definition of what God said about the dead. We're going to go to Psalms 146 real quick. Psalms 146, and we're going to read verses 3 and 4. We're requiring a biblical definition or a biblical understanding about the dead. Psalms 146, and pick it up at verse 3. Put not your trust in princes knowing the Son of Man, and whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. So David, the psalmist, is saying that when a person dies and he goes to the earth and they put him in the ground, his very thoughts perish. They cease. They're no longer in existence. Let's go to uh, Ecclesiastes and let's hear the words of, this, of the wisest man who's ever uh, walked the earth. Besides Jesus, when Jesus when, when Jesus appeared in the form of a man, let's go to Solomon. We're going to uh, pro, uh, Ecclesiastes nine and see what uh, Solomon has to say about the dead. Ecclesiastes 9, and we're going to pick it up at verse 2. All things come alike to all. There's one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean, to the unclean and to the unclean, to him that sacrifice and to him that sacrifice not. As is the good, so is the sinner, and he that swear as he that fear and oath. So there's this one event that happens to every individual, live every individual who was alive, no matter your station in life, no matter your your type of education, no matter what type of fame you have, no matter who you are or what you do, there is one event that happens to each and every one of us who are living today. Let's go to verse three. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun. That there is one event unto all. Each and every one of us are going to experience this one event. Yeah, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil. And madness is in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. That dead, that death, every individual on earth, unless he is alive during when Jesus returns, they, they're going to experience death. Every individual who has lived before us has died with the exception, who has experienced death with the exception of, of uh, Enoch, who was translated, which was going to happen to those who are around prior uh, when Jesus returned. But until then, everybody has experienced death. Verse 4, for to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. What is this hope that had that who that the person who's joined to the living has? For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Why is a living dog better than a dead lion? Verse 5. For the living know that they shall die. But the dead know not anything. The dead know not anything. We're establishing the foundation. Uh, David said that the the, the dead, when they die, they thoughts perish. Solomon is saying now that a living dog is better than a dead lion because 
The living know that they should die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their memory is gone once they hit, hit the ground, once they die. Skip down to verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goes. Let's go to Job. Let's go to Job and put some more, some more uh, on this foundation. Job 14. Job 14. And we're going to pick it up at verse 10. Job 14 and 10. For man dieth and wasted away. Yeah, man give us up the ghost. And where is he? Skip, to, uh, skip on down to verse 12. So man lieth down and rises not till the heavens be no more. Let's read that again because you know, this right here, well, all these, all these verses that I'm reading right now as our foundation is going to be very vital as we get into our lesson. But this right here needs to be highlighted also and with intensity. It says, so man lieth down, meaning he dies, and he raises not from that dead till the heavens be no more. So this man that dies is not going to rise up until the heavens be no more. They should not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. So when a person dies, he's not going to be raised up out their sleep. And we know they're sleeping. I didn't put this in this lesson because I didn't want to uh, extend it out. But I can show you conclusively from a biblical perspective that sleep is equated with death. It says when all those uh, who are sleeping in the grave hear his voice. Jesus talked about uh, a Nat Lazarus. Our friend Lazarus has, 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 has uh, went to sleep. And the disciples thought that he was just talking about normal sleep. And he said, no, nah, Lazarus is dead. But he used the word sleep in relation to death. So it says, so man lieth down and raises not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. They're not going to be raised out of their sleep until the heavens be no more. This is what the word of God is saying through the mouth of these prophets who he is told to be, speak these words. This is our foundation. Now, as I said, he is not a God of the dead. Let's go to 1 Samuel and start analyzing this. He is not a God of the dead. A biblical understanding of 1 Samuel 28. So we're going to read 1 Samuel 28, 7 through 15. Then we're going to go back and, and, and break this down. Excuse me. 1 Samuel 28, 7 through 15. Then Saul, then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said unto him, Behold, there is a woman that has a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the spirit, familiar spirit, and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, Thou knowest that what Saul has done, how has he cut how he has cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? That's verse 10. And Saul swore to the swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there should no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Solomon. I mean, excuse me, Sam, yes, Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid. Be not afraid. For what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. 
And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An, an old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why has thou disquieted me to bring me up? Now, this is the verse, these are the verses that people go to to say that, well, yeah, the people who are dead are still somehow or another, their spirits will run around and you could communicate with them. But we're going to examine this and thoroughly see what is happening right here. Because remember, as our foundation was established, that the dead know not nothing. They know not anything. We also read in Job where it says that the dead lies down and he rises not up until the, until the heavens be no more. So we need to find out what's going on right here because there isn't any contradiction in the Bible. So what we need to do is find out what's going on here. But what we're going to do first is to find out how it came to be that Saul, who was appointed king over the a house of Israel who is the inheritance of God who is the vineyard of the Lord came to be to find himself consulting with a person who deals with familiar spirits who the Lord said not to do have anything to do with it and it is an abomination so before we do that let's go to Deuteronomy 18 let's go to Deuteronomy 18 and 9 real quick Deuteronomy 18 and 9. When thou, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his sons or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or any observer of times or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consultant with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. So Paul or Saul is consulting a person with familiar spirits and who can also be considered a necromancer. So these are two things which the Lord says is an abomination. So we need to find out how it is that Saul, who was anointed the king, the first king over the tribe of Israel, who is God's inheritance, who is the vineyard of the Lord, come to find himself to stoop so low in life to where he is consulting with something which the Lord told him is an abomination. See, Saul just did not become just up one day say, hey, let me go consult with a medium or familiar spirit so I can talk to Samuel. Like in most cases, like in every case that we find ourselves in, every situation we find ourselves in, we just did not wake up into that situation. It was a, that situation we find ourselves in was a culmination of a series of events and decisions that we made that eventually led us to where we at right now. For an example, if an individual is engaged in adultery, he just doesn't find himself automatically in a motel room with somebody, with somebody else's wife and he's married also. They just didn't, our dream of Jenny pop up in that motel room. No, it started with a series of events. Stuff that could have been stopped initially from the start. A certain conversation. A, a, a certain look. A certain compliment. And from there it just built itself, built itself, and built itself, and built itself, and built itself up. Until eventually that person finds himself in a motel room with another woman who is married and he's married. So Saul did not just wake up and go to this medium. He ended up going to his medium as a result of other events occurring. And that's how we're going we're gonna to see what these events are that led to him seeing this medium. And then we're going to be able to, once we have that in our, in our knowledge, 
into the context, then we're able to then understand what is actually happening right here. So let's go to 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel 13. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. 1 Samuel 13 and verse 1. I made a mistake. I should have put something in, but I'll figure it out when I get there. Let me make sure I got my pen. I was thinking about it at work yesterday. 1 Samuel 13 and 1. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Mishmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. So Saul has 2,000 men with him. And this is during his second year of reign. So let's skip on down to verse 5. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Mitzmat eastward from Beth Haven. So look at this. Saul has gathered 2,000 men to go to battle with the Philistines. The Philistines, they bring 30,000 horsemen, excuse me, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. That right there is 36,000 to your 2,000 men. And if you know anything about military, even if you don't know, you just have a cursory understanding about military, you have an infantry, I mean, excuse me, you have a cavalry and different or, or, or artillery things. So if you got 30,000 men on, on chariots and you got 30, uh, 6,000 horsemen, no telling how many foot soldiers you, because you're going to have more foot soldiers than anything else. So you're possibly looking at 50,000 men to your 2,000 men. Because it says... And people as the sand which is on the seashore. So you can't count how many people are on the seashore, how many grains of sand on the seashore. So this is a large multitude of people. We know at least 36,000 coming up against 2,000. So let's keep on reading. Verse 6. When the men of Israel saw that they were in strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. For as, as for Saul, he was yet in Gilgad and all the people followed him tremble. These people were scared. So a lot of them started fleeing, abandoning him, deserting the military. So that 2,000 that you initially started off with going up against a minimum of 36,000 people began to get smaller and smaller as people began to see this number and started relying on what their eyes are seeing visually and not dealing with the spiritual aspect that God is with us. Just like when they came back, when, when Moses sent those spies out to spy the land, they came back with that report saying that, hey man, there's giants in this land. The same attitude right here is what caused them to stay in the wilderness for 40 years. He said, man, there's giants in the land, and we look like grasshoppers to them. They didn't want to go up. The people heard this. They didn't want to go to battle because they heard that there were some giants there. And, and these walls around the cities were so great and so formidable. But Caleb and Joshua, they, they were like, no, nah, man, this is all. Let's go do this. But because of this attitude that they're displaying right here is the same thing that their ancestors did not too long ago when uh, 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 they were supposed to take the promised land. They began seeing all these numbers, became fearful, and began to desert Saul. So now this 2,000 that Saul had probably is now down to 1,800, 1,500, 1,400. So let's keep on. Verse 7. And, and he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgad, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and a peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. 
And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went, to, went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, what hast thou done? Samuel didn't come to greet him. He asked him a question. Man, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou came not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at mismatch, therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to give that, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt off. What does Saul mean that he forced himself? So what he means is that the only ones who are authorized to make a burnt offering, offering to the Lord are the priests. You can go back and do some reading on your own, some research and homework on your own in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and even in Exodus where the Lord lays out the protocol of burnt offerings or any type of offerings done to him. Not anybody could come up in here and do give him an offering. That's why Samuel, when, when Saul did that burnt offering, he said as soon as he got finished, Samuel popped up and the first thing that Samuel said is, man, what have you done? Because the Lord had to inform Samuel, hey man, you need to go get Saul because he's out of line. You go get him or I'm going to get him just like he got Aaron's two sons when they brought that strange fire which the Lord told them a specific way how to bring that fire to him. They brought some strange fire out of, order, out, of, out of accord with the protocol and the Lord popped them. So the Lord told Saul, I mean Samuel, hey man, you need to go get him before I get him. So that's why the first thing Samuel said when he appeared on the scene is, what has it that y'all done? Now, verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, thou has done foolishly. Why have you done foolishly? Because you have stepped outside the bounds of the protocol for which the Lord has established to govern the house of Israel. Only people who are supposed to offer uh, uh, offerings to him are the priests. So verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, thou has done foolishly. Thou has not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. Now, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now the, thy kingdom should not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people. Because thou has not kept that which the Lord commanded. So that was Saul's first strike. He said the kingdom was being taken out of his hand. That's Saul's first strike. He offered up offerings which only the priests were allowed to make those offerings. Let's go to 1 Samuel 15. And pick it up at verse 1. We're going to look at his second strike. See, the Lord playing hardball. Verse 15, uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1. <laughs> Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to announce thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken unto to the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I remember that which... Amalek did to Israel, how he did wait for him in the way when he came out of Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. This is an order that the Lord has given to Saul through the mouth of Samuel. He said, go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all. Utterly destroy all. 
Like Brother Boo would say, absolute is all. There's nothing outside of all. All is all. He said, go destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, cattle and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Talim, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Canaanites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalek, lest I destroy you with them. For he showed kindness, for ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Canaanites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou came to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. You tripping already. He said, kill everybody. All. But you letting the king live. You already tripping. You already tripping, Saul. And he utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag. You weren't supposed to spare nothing. And the best and the best of the sheep, which you were supposed to kill all. And the ox, which you're supposed to kill all, and of the fatling, which you were supposed to kill all, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. And what God said, utterly destroy all. And here it says, and they would not utterly destroy them, but everything else that was vile and refused, that they destroyed. Now they being a the respecter. God said, destroy everything, the best. And the worst, everything got to go. You see something that look good and you want to keep it, but that's going to cost you. So let's see. Then came the word of the Lord unto Saul of Samuel. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a, a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the, of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen which I hear? Okay, so you saying that you perform the commandments of the Lord. Now when I left here, there wasn't no sheep and there wasn't no cattle. Now I come back and you said you, you follow the commandments of the Lord, which was to kill everything. Everything that breathes, you kill. But now I'm hearing all these sheep and these cows making this noise. If you, can, if you fulfill everything the Lord said, then what am I hearing this for? Verse 15. And Saul said, and Saul said, they have brought them. They, they, you the king. So Saul ain't even accepting responsibility for his actions. He's passing it off on somebody else. He said, they, who was they? The people. And we're going to see that. He said, and Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we utterly destroyed. He's, he's passing off the blame unto the people. He's passing the blame off unto the people. You the king. It starts at the top. What you say, go. If you say kill everything, everything's going to be killed. And if they don't want to kill everything, then they're going to get killed because you the king. Verse 16, then Samuel said unto Saul, stay, I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, say on, make sure I'm staying on track. And Samuel, uh, okay, let's skip on down to, uh, uh, Samuel, let's keep on reading on in there. 
17. And Samuel said, When thou was little, and in thy own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribe of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore did thou not obey the voice of the Lord? But didst fly upon the spoils and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agad, the king of the Amalekites, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. That ain't what the Lord said to do. The Lord said, Kill everything. The Lord said, Kill everything. So, Verse 21, he's going to blame it on the people again. But the people, but the people took of the spoils, sheep and ox, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. Now Saul is admitting that all this stuff should have been utterly destroyed. Let's read, listen to, this is what I say, we got to read and understand what we read. Saul says, in, um, Saul says in verse 21, but the people took of the spoils, the sheep and the ox, the chief of the things which should have been utterly, utterly destroyed. It should have been destroyed. So he's acknowledging that the Lord said utterly destroy everything, but he is blaming the, this stuff on the people. But you the king. The Lord told you to do this. He didn't tell the people to do this. He told you to do this. And in turn, it was your responsibility and your obligation to command the people to do what you were commanded to do. The people are only going to do what you allow them to do. They followed your lead. Verse 21, uh, start over. It says, But the people took of the spoils, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifice as in obedience to as, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of So the Lord said, man, it don't matter. All this sacrifice don't mean nothing. What means something is to obey his words. That's what it means. That's what means something. Verse 23. Excuse me. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as, is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou has rejected the word of the Lord, he also reject thee from being king. That was Saul's second strike. The Lord is playing hard. It ain't no three strikes and you out. You already tripped up when you gave this burnt offering, which you were not supposed to do, according to my words, when the only people who were supposed to give an offering were the priests. Okay? I let you still become king. But you started tripping hard and you, I told you to do this and now it's like, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. Okay, since you want to do what you want to do, bam, you out of here. This was going to happen. And like I said, I'm just building us a context to understand 28 and 75, how it is that Paul Saul ended up consulting the medium. Okay, so let's go on, let's get, let's go on down to, uh, 16. 16, chapter 16 and verse 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? So Samuel loved Saul. And he's been crying and mourning, man. Oh man, Lord, man, Lord, man, it's, man that's my boy. The Lord finally tired of him belly aching, crying and whining. Man, how long is it you gonna sit up here and cry about somebody who have I thrown away? And the reason I'm thrown away is because you know he didn't do what I told him to do. He rebelled against my words. So quit crying. And he tells him to do something. So he said, and the Lord said unto Samuel, How long would thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thy horn with oil. And go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So Saul is over with. He's through with Saul. He's just letting the course of time occur for Saul's demise 
And at the same time, he's allowing David to be built up. So let's skip on down to verse 14. I'm mean, a student. That's what I missed. Verse 13. So now when Saul finally goes down to where uh, Jesse's at, and if you read on your own uh, all the way to 13, he, he's, Saul's trying to find out which son it is he wants to announce, uh, the Lord wants him to announce, and all, all of Jesse's sons are there but David, and finally David appears, and Saul announce, anoints David to be the king over Israel. So this is where we at in verse 13. Then Saul took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, Pay attention. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. The spirit of the Lord came upon David that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Keep that in mind. Put that on the back burner because it's going to be very important. Verse 14. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. See, Saul, if, if, if I would have went back, we go back and read when, when, when Samuel anointed Saul to be king, and after uh, he seen a series of events that he was told that would occur, such as some priests coming down from the mountain, he's going to meet some people over here, he's going to see this and that, that would prove to him what Samuel, what Samuel was telling him that the Lord is appointed him to be king. Then it says that, that at that time, the spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. So, and from that time until the time when Saul started messing up with that burnt offering on and 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 and, and uh, not following the commands to kill all these people, the spirit of the Lord was on Saul. But when he anointed David, the spirit of the Lord came on on David and left Saul. So let's let's get into the spirit. Let me finish this out, and we're gonna look at this. So it said, "But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord." trouble him so let's look at what this spirit of the let's look at this spirit let's look at this spirit real quick let's go let's go to well yeah i could i could i could do that i jumped ahead before i got where i was but let's go to 10 to show how the spirit of the lord was on saul at first i didn't even know i put that in there i'm i'm, I'm just rolling okay this one said this one saul was anointed king first Samuel 10 Verse 1, then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, is it not, and we already read that, is it not because the Lord has anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Okay, let's skip, to, skip on down to verse 6. And after a series of events occurred, right, it said, verse 6, and the spirit of the Lord came upon thee. And thou shalt, and the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into a new man. So after all these different events that's going to occur in that time period, after that time, then the spirit of the Lord is going to descend upon Saul. So uh, verse seven says, "And let it be when these signs come to thee that thou do as occurred occasion serve thee, for God is with thee." For God is with thee, right? We're talking about the spirit of the Lord that's sitting on Saul. Let's skip to verse 9. And so it was that when he had turned his back to go from Saul, Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the spirit of God came upon him. So the spirit of God was upon Saul all the way until he started messing up. And then, and then, even then, the Spirit of God was still with them until after the uh, uh, Samuel anointed David. Because it said, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So let's talk, let's look real quick about the Spirit of the Lord that was upon him. Let's get an understanding about the Spirit of the Lord. Because we, we, what we don't, a lot of people don't understand, and Brother Blue breaks it down real, real, real well in his lessons called uh, the Spirit of God in his many forms, but I'm just going to deal with the Spirit we're dealing with right now. And But he's talking about how the Spirit could be in a, a, a in the form of words, and he gives scriptures to prove that the Spirit is words. One of those scriptures when Jesus said, 
eat, uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood, the flesh probably nothing, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. The spirit is also could be in the form of a breath. And they got scriptures to support that. The spirits can also be in the form of uh, uh, angels, which is what we get to. So the spirits of thoughts, when, when that youngster was uh, with Job and his friends and his friends were talking bad about him, and he told him, elders, hey, man, I kept my peace as long as I can. And he got to talking about the spirit in him straight up. He's talking about his thoughts. So the spirit can appear in many forms, but we're just going to deal with the form that it's appearing in right here when we speak about the spirit of the Lord left uh, Saul and evil spirit came upon him. So let's go to first he I mean Hebrew 1. We're going to look at these spirits real quick. We're going to go to Hebrew 1 and pick it up at verse 7. Hebrew 1 verse 7. And of the angels, and of the angels, so we're speaking about angels right here. And of the angels, he said, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. So angels are spirits. Angels are spirits, and they are his ministers. Okay. Verse uh, 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstools? Are they not all ministering spirits? Who are they? These angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So who are these angels sent forth to minister to? Those who are going to be heirs to salvation. Those are us. So these angels are around us. And I'm going to show you this. Let's go to uh, Psalms 34. Let's go to Psalms 34 real quick. We're looking at these we're looking at these spirit of the Lord that was upon Saul and upon David and the evil spirit. And, 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 and notice it made they said angels. It didn't say good angel, it didn't say bad angel, it didn't say holy angel, it didn't say fallen angel. It says angels. We'll deal with the adjective which describes the noun later on, but all angels, there isn't any angels that is not up under the jurisdiction of the Lord. There isn't any spirit that is up under, not under the jurisdiction of the Lord. And we're going to get into that in a few minutes. But Psalms 34 7. Psalms 34 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and deliver them. So those who fear the Lord have an angel camped about them. They have an angel that's camped about them. So if you go to, uh, I don't know why I put that there. Let's go to, let's go to 2nd King. I mean, let's go to uh, Exodus 23. I should have cleaned this up before I got started. But I was intending to do that today. While I was taking care of this business, but uh, I got I got my business taken care of faster than I thought. But anyway, Exodus twenty three and twenty. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Pro provoke him not. Pro uh, beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgression. For his, my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thy enemies and an adversary unto thy adversaries. For my angels shall go forth before thee and bring thee in to it, bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Pezzites and the Canaanites and the Hevites and the Jebusites and I will cut them off. So this angel is going to be our protection. This angel is going to lead the people. Let's let's check out. Okay, uh, I know what I was in. Let's let's look at the let's look at uh Second Kings. Now I know what that is. Second Second Kings six and eight. Let's look at something about these angels. See, this is doing. 
Yeah, six and eight. Um, okay, yeah, this is during the time of the prophet Elias, and the Assyrian army was riding down on, 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 the, on the people, and people were getting scared and everything. So we're going to look at what, something real quick. 2 Kings 6 and 8. Then the king of Assyria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. So every time that the king of Assyria wanted to do something, the children of Israel already knew about it. So he thought there was a spy inside of his camp. But then he was told, now nah, it ain't a spy inside their camp. What it is is that they got a prophet in their camp named Elijah. So let's skip down to verse 15. So now when all these, when they, they say, okay, well, well, if that's the case, let's ride down on Elijah. Once we get rid of Elisha, then this spy who, who's informing all the children of Israel where it's going on and where I'm at, that'll eliminate that. So we got to get rid of him first. So they riding down on Elisha, the whole army coming down to get him. So one of the leaders servants is like, man, look at all these people coming down. There. Man, what are we going to do? It ain't nothing here. This is where we're going to pick it up at. Uh, well, I'll start at 15 just to give you a little context of it. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Allows, my master, how, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And the, and the and the one like he looking around like man what are you talking about it's just it's just about five or six of us it's about two three thousand half of you know when you when you scared when you scared and you see a group of people riding down on you it might be about twenty people but in your mind and the way you describe it later on like man it's about a hundred thousand people out there because <laughs> to you it's just two of y'all and it's a thousand of them so what's the difference between a thousand and a hundred thousand against two people so. He's tripping, and Elijah, Elijah's telling man, it's more than us than them. They're like, man, where they at? I don't see nothing. They ain't just, just us up in here. It's verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fires round about. These horses and chariots of fires were angels that surround the believers. And that's when Elijah told them, man, go down there and, and smite these people with blindness. And they blinded their army and led them to another place. They led them to a place where, where the children of Israel actually was and they got killed. But that's the point I'm making here is about these angels that surround the believers and protect them. So let's go back to 1 Kings 16. 1 Kings 16. First Kings 16, we're going to pick it back up where it says that the, 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 the spirit of the Lord left, left, first King, first King, oh, no, 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 sorry, first Samuel, sorry about that, first Samuel, 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 14. So it said, But the spirit of the Lord departed Saul. What spirit was this? This was that protecting angel that was upon Saul once he was anointed king. And that spirit went to be on David. So then it says, And an evil spirit, which is an angel from the Lord, troubled, troubled him. So now, he done, let, he done lost his protection. Saul done lost his protection. And the Lord sent an evil spirit to be upon him. See, here's the thing, and it, and, and it deals with Halloween's coming up. See, people think when we read about, and I think we're going to get into that. We might we might go to that verse. But people think that when, and what's that, Revelation 12 and 7 through 9 or whatever, when, when the devil and his angels were cast out into earth from heaven, they're no longer in heaven, People think that the devil and his angels are roaming around earth unchecked. No, they up under the jurisdiction of the God. They're still up under the Lord's jurisdiction. And when the Lord says do something, they're going to do it. You know what I'm saying? Because what it say? It say, uh, 
It says, you say you believe in, 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 in God, you do well. Even the devils believe and they tremble because now they know the power. They, they, when they was up in heaven, they understood, uh, uh, they, they let the, uh, 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 who was his name? His name was Lucifer then, deceive them and to think that they had some type of win against God and, and the righteous angels there. But now they know. They know the power of God. So that's why every time you see Jesus, and I think we're going to see one of them verses pretty soon, every time Jesus appeared on the scene, so that, they cried out, hey, man, hey, whoa. Whoa, Jesus, please slow down, son of God. Because they know. They fear. They know they up under the jurisdiction of the Lord. And when the Lord tells them to do something, hey, although I'm not in heaven no more, I'm still up under jurisdiction, I ain't finna rebel, although I know I got something coming in the end. So, Let's go to Job 1. I mean, yeah, let's go to Job 1. I'm going to show you how these angels are still up under, these fallen angels who people call devils and demons walking around on earth are still under the jurisdiction of the Lord. They got to do what God says to do. It ain't like they just rumbling around doing whatever they want to do, entering in and out of people's body. If you have their heads of protection around you, they cannot touch you. That's what God said. That's what this angel, and we're finna, we finna read this right now. Job 1. Job 1, we're going to pick it up at Job 1 and 1. There was a man in the land, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that is feared evil, or feared God and is chewed evil. Okay, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also amongst them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comes thou then, Satan? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down it. So let's let's put our finger right here. Put put, put a marker right here. We are gonna go right back. He said he's been walking. He's been walking up and down the earth, to and fro. Let's put a marker right here. We are coming right back. Let's go to First Peter. Let's go to First Peter. Let's go to First Peter five and eight. We're gonna look at this walking up and down the earth. First Peter five and eight. It says, "Be sober, be vigilant." Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he can, he may devour. So the Satan has been walking up and down the earth, seeking who, seeing who can, seeing who can devour, who he can devour. It's like a person, like a burglar, or a person that's going in the parking lot, walking by every car, checking to see if the car car is unlocked by checking the door handle. Well, this one's locked. This one's locked. This was locked. This was locked. You know what I'm saying? Finally, he found one that's open. He get into that car and burn off. Was well, the same thing. He's been walking up and down the earth, seeking who can find anybody who does not have this protection upon him. Now let's go back to first, uh, 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 John, John one and seven. And the Lord said unto Satan. Which comes down? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and shews evil? Here's Satan's answer. Then Satan answered to the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for not? Has thou has not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? Have you not put protection on this man? Let's keep on. Let me let me read finish reading that and then I'm gonna say what I'm saying. Has thou not made a hedge about him and made his house about his house and about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Okay. Let's look at this. Satan's been walking up and down the earth seeking who can divide. And when I look and read this, I remember this commercial, the ADT commercial with Bing Rhymes, where they had them burglars looking like they finna the burglarize a house, and Bing Rhymes standing in the front yard like this, 
Don't even try it. And he was the security, so he's the representation of the security system that this house has around him. And the burglars, they kind of sleeped off, right? That's how it is with that protection that the Lord has placed on you. But just because Satan came up and seen that you got that protection on you, that didn't mean that, 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 that okay, well, he's protected by the Lord. I'm going to draw off. Now, Satan slid back and started doing some, uh, 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 reconnaissance. He started gathering information about Job. He said, you put a protection on this house on everything. You increase this up. He put out, he found a ways how he could defeat the security system of Job. He see, so he sat back and watched him. Just because the devil can't get to us right then and there don't mean that he's going to stop Trying to get to us. He going to slide back. Like when he, when he went up on Jesus. And Jesus smashed him with the word. He said he left until another time. To another season. He's going to come back. That's because you got that protection on you. Don't mean that you can just sit there with your feet kicked up. But he said be sober and be vigilant. Because your adversary walks around like the devil. I mean walks around like a royal lion seeking who he can devour. He was monitoring Job, trying to find chicks in his arm, and he can't find no chicks in his arm. So he tells the Lord, "Say, yeah, you. The only reason he's doing this because you got this protection from around him." But let's see what he tell him, verse eleven. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse thee to the first. And the Lord said unto Satan, "Behold, all that he has is in thy power. Only unto him put not thy hand." So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So see. The Lord making a bet with Satan. Man, my boy here is going to ride with me whether I have protection on him or not. Whether he has anything or not. But the point I want to make is that Satan had to check in and get permission to do anything before he could touch Job. The angels, Satan the devil and his angels, they had to get permission to do anything to anybody who the Lord has put protection on. It ain't like, oh, the devil let the devil out. If the devil is assaulting you, the Lord, it's because the Lord is letting the devil assault you. And it's up to you to find out what it is that you're doing or have done to allow the Lord to take that means of protection from you. And in some cases, it might be he's just so confident in you that no matter what you what what happens to you, you're gonna stand strong because of your faith that you display. Job did nothing wrong, but if you read on, he lost everything. Let's go. Let's uh, continue. Let's go to uh, Job two. So after all the stuff, Job done lost everything. Done lost his house. Done lost his car. Done lost his family. Done lost his wealth, his means, of income. He done lost everything. And succession, back to back, bam, once he hear information about his kids being killed, bam, he hear information about people taking it. It's like, it's like, man, you at work and you find out that you laid off. And then when you try to call somebody, you find out your phone's been cut off. Then when you find out your phone's been cut off, you try to get you an Uber and find out that your bank account's been closed. Then you find out that your bank account's closed. You finally get home and find out your, your house done burnt down. And while you stand outside your house being burnt down, your neighbor come across the street and tell you that your kids done died in an accident at school. Then from that, you know what I'm saying? This is just coming back to back. But what Job said, he said, he said to Job, he said, Verse 21, I didn't put it, he said, Naked came I, Job said, it, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave it, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord might put, you might, your faith might be so strong, the Lord's going to send you through some more deals like that, and knowing that you're going to say this at the end. But the point I'm making is that the devil and his angels can't do nothing without permission. And I'm going to get into that in another lesson about when this happens, what you need to do. But let's go to verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also amongst them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence did I come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down it. 
And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and shews evil? And still he holds fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yeah, all that a man has when he give for his life. But put forth thy hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to the face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hand, but save his life. So he still couldn't touch Job physically, because we see after that he hit Job with some boils and infirmities and stuff. He still couldn't touch Job without permission. So these angels ain't roaming around, these, these demons ain't roaming around earth unchecked. Just because they got kicked out of heaven don't mean they got kicked out of the jurisdiction of God. Let's go on. I'm, I'm gonna have to, um, let's go on down to let's show another example. Let's go to Matthew 28. Let's go to Matthew 28. I forgot where I was gonna stop for today. But hey, <laughs> I'm lost in the word. <laughs> Matthew 28. I'm gonna show you another example of these devils having to get permission to do something before they can do it. Especially to one who has a hedge of protection around them. Matthew 28. No, excuse me, sorry. Matthew 8 and 28. Matthew 8 and 28. And when he and when he came to this other side into the country of the Gernigesines, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was, these are the demons speaking, right? And there was a good, good way off from them a herd of many swans feed. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into their herd. And he said unto them, Go. So they had to give permission to leave that man's body to go into them, them swine, because Jesus is fixing to cast them out. So they said, Okay, if you cast us out, please just throw us into that, to that, to that herd of swine. They couldn't just go into that herd of swine on their own. They had to give permission from Jesus. But I want to point something out to you that is Overlook. It says, it says right here, and, and this is something on the way to learn something. I'm gonna give you a, a perfect example about what your teacher or, 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 or instructor or pastor is supposed to do when you have a biblical question. That's why I say we don't interpret anything. It says right here, it says, and behold, they cried out, saying, verse 29, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? What do those demons mean? Do you, have you come to torment us before the time? What is he talking about? See, people don't ask that question. And if a person asks that question, and the person who answered it just comes off the top of their head and say, well, that means this and that, they might be right that it means this and that, that and that. But they don't do what I'm fixing to show you what they need to do in order to answer a biblical question. Then they might be one of the people who the Lord tell you to take heed and be aware of. So let's find out. Let's get an answer to this question. What they mean by art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Let's go to Revelation 12 real quick. Revelation 12. I'm picking up in verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angel, and prevailed not. Neither was there a place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out, of, cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So this is how these angels found, found themselves to be here on earth. Let's go to Jude real quick. Let's go to Jude, which is right before 
Revelation. We're going to go to Jude, and there's only one chapter in Jude, so we're going to go to Jude, verse 6. How's that? Okay, Jude, verse 6. It says, Jude, verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until, until the judgment of the great day. So these angels that were kicked out, that left their first estate, they're under chains of darkness. What does that mean? We can't see them with our physical eyes. So they're up under chains of darkness, and they're going to remain under that chains of darkness until the judgment of that great day. What great day is that? That is the day of the great throne, uh, 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 the white throne judgment. Let's go to Peter, Second Peter real quick. I might be moving fast because I'm running out of time, but uh, I'll be on. I'll be. I'll pick it back up some other time, Lord willing. Let's go to that's James. Let's go to Second Peter. Second Peter two, and verse four. For if God spared Second Peter two verse four, for if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell. And deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved until judgment. When is this judgment? This judgment is, well, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna read about it. But it says right here, it says right here that they were cast into hell. Now this hell, people think, is, 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 is a, uh, it's a lake of fire. But we know, if we read Revelation 20, and 4, let's read that real, real quick. Revelation 20. Revelation 20 and then read 13. And this is after the judgment. We might be going back to this in a minute. Now, this is the white throne judgment, right? So it says, after that, it says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up dead which were in them. So there's dead people in hell, but this hell is not the hell that people think of as a lake of fire. But why do we know this? Because it says, And they were judged every man according to their work. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. See, death is a state of condition. One of the definitions of death in the Bible is a state of condition. And this earth is hell for them angels who were kicked out of heaven. And they are in chains of darkness until they are judged and thrown into the lake of fire. How do I know that? Let's read. Uh, well, let's go. We're in Revelation 20. Let's go uh, to verse 1. We're already in Revelation 20. We're going to go to verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should, de should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be finished. So this is doing, this is, that thousand years is dealing with the thousand year reign of Jesus. Now they're talking about the devil, but also it said that, that the devil should not deceive no more. See, nobody's going to be here to speak other than what thus says the Lord. So if the devil was thrown into this bottomless pit, so were his angels thrown into this bottomless pit for a thousand years. Because his angels go out and deceive. His angels are ministers who transform themselves into ministers of life, who deceive the people. So let's skip on down to uh, verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosened out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And, when, and, when, and they went up to the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and, and the beloved sea. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them, this is after a thousand years is up, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So one more place and then we're going to go back. Matthew 25, but it says that they're going to be cast into the lake of fire 
The devil's going to be cast into the lake of fire along with him, just like his the, the, the devil and his angel were cast down to earth. So then the devil was cast into the bottom of the pit. So his angel was cast into the bottom of the pit with him. And then it said the devil was cast into the lake of fire. So will his angels be cast into the lake of fire and they will be tormented. And this is after the thousand year reign of Jesus. So now we have a time and we have also an explanation about the tormented. But let's go one more place and then we're going to go back. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. This is just a rabbit hole that I fell down real quick. Matthew 25. And just pick it up at verse 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So this fire, which is a lake of fire, was prepared for the devil and his angels, right? So now then, let's go back to Matthew 8 and 29. And it says, and behold, they cried out saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, the son of God? Art thou come here hither to torment us before the time? So now we know what, 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 why they asked that question. Have you came here to torment us? Meaning, have you kicked? Because it's talking about casting them out. Because it says, so 31 says, So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go into the herd of swine. So they talking about getting cast out. So they asked, Man, you ain't finna throw us in the lake of fire now. We ain't supposed to go into the lake of fire until after the thousand year reign that you have on earth. And this ain't the thousand year reign. So we know what they mean by that according to the word of God. So I pointed that out just to show that if you if you ask this question, just do it, just do a test. Ask, ask your preacher or your teacher or somebody who's supposed to be educated in the word. Hey, what does the devils mean by in Matthew 28? I mean Matthew 8 and 29. What do they mean by art thou come to come to, to torment us before the time? What does that mean? And if he comes up with an answer, and it might be the right answer, if he comes up with the answer without going into this book, then Tell them, and well, show me how you draw that conclusion. Tell me how you come to that conclusion. If they are willing to or unable to go into this word of God, like they might go to different verses, but but the answer needs to come from this book, like I just did. If they don't do that, then they one of the people the Lord told you to take heed of. But the reason I came here was to show you, was to show you that these devils were the fallen angels that are roaming around on earth. They still up under the jurisdiction of God. They still got to do what thus says the Lord, when the Lord says to do that, when the Lord tells them to do that. And I'm going to give you all, I think that's where I'm going to stop. I give, I, I'll pick this up tomorrow, Lord willing. I'll pick this up tomorrow to give you an example of this. But we're dealing with, let's go back to uh, uh, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 16. And 14. We're dealing with the Spirit of God. Verse 16, it said, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So we know that was that protective head that the Lord placed upon Saul had left him. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So when we know this evil spirit of the Lord that troubled him. We're going to see examples of that tomorrow. We know this evil the spirit of the Lord are these devils, and we're going to see this. So this is just part one of this is just part one of he is not the God of the dead a biblical explanation to 1 Samuel 28 7 through 15 uh, I pray that somebody was edified and I hope that you join me tomorrow for part two of this lesson in Jesus mighty name Amen <laughs>